Sweet. We'll give this a couple of minutes for folks to get on in. Hopefully everybody's um, either had breakfast or lunch or supper or strong amounts of caffeine wherever you're at. <laughs> hey, the world revolves around caffeine. Everything else is just filler, right? <laughs> Cool. I'll give everybody a few more minutes and then we'll get rolling here. Okay. So I, yeah, I was telling David before the webinar, I had to reboot my desk. My stand up <laughs> desk is no longer standing up. So I'm doing this sitting down. So this should be an interesting uh, webinar for me, messing up my game. <laughs> Rebooting desk. I, I, I'll never, ever, ever say I've seen everything. I've seen a lot, <laughs> but uh, the the phrase "reboot my desk" is always interesting. I've been on a plane on the ground when they rebooted the plane. That was fun. I've been, yeah, I've been on that one. <laughs> and I was like, "Why?" It I've takes like twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, I've had to reboot a car while it was in motion before. That was fun. <clears throat> okay, got a bunch of folks in here now. This is fantastic. Okay, we'll go ahead and get rolling. Uh, so um, can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, this is the HADR chapter for February 2019. We're going to start with a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, first of all, the past summit registration is now open. If you haven't been to this event, it is fantastic. If you have been, you better make plans to go there this year because I'm going to find you. It is <laughs> awesome. Learn more. Register at the link below. It is an outstanding event. It's one I just I won't miss it. It's great. So hopefully I'll see you all there. Um, and we will have uh, hopefully a promo code a little bit later in the year. So if you want to use uh, our code, uh, you get a bit of a discount and it, it gives a little bit of kickback to the user group here so we can do some giveaways eventually. <clears throat> also, if you are a, a skilled speaker and you're interested in submitting a pre-conference training session for the past summit, uh, I do believe that this closes tomorrow sometime. So submit there. It is a blast to give these all-day sessions at the summit. I've done a couple of now, and I, I love it. Uh, so hopefully, if you're interested, go ahead and submit. And it's one of those things, don't think that you're not qualified. You can do this. You really can. Um, and coming up on February 21st, this is really cool. This is the very first Pass Marathon Spanish edition. So fantastic. Uh, if uh, Spanish is your native language, go check it out. Uh, it's, it's just it's really cool to see a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> um, the Microsoft Roadshow might be coming to a town near you. You can learn more down below there. Um, it's pre predominantly around SQL Server and Azure Data Services. Um, Great event. It's one of those things. I'm hoping I can make it. I know it's coming up in uh, the closest area to me is Chicago. Hoping I can get there. Um, upcoming virtual group webinars. You're on this one right now. We got one with the professional development chapter tomorrow, uh, data architecture tomorrow as well. And both of those are fantastic. Um, both good friends of mine. Um, I'm hoping I can tune into those. Uh, just a bunch of these over the next month or so. Uh, DBA hybrid, DBA fundamentals, global Hebrew, global Italian, <clears throat> DevOps, PowerShell, DBA fundamentals. Just fantastic events. These are free. These are recorded. If you haven't already subscribed to learn about what's coming when it's, uh, you know, when it's first announced, do it. You don't have to listen to it live. These are recorded. They are amazing. Um, the full list is right here. They've pared these down a little bit over the last few months, uh, but just fantastic content on here. Uh, these are world class and they're free. It's free education. This helps your career. This helps you. This helps your organization. Go there. <clears throat> Upcoming SQL Saturdays. If you've never been to one of these, they're everywhere. They're all over the world. They are incredible. I'll be at the Chicago one here in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's well worth it. Um, and if you're on here, chances are you're already a member of PASS, but if you are not, join up. It's free, great networking, great content. You know, again, improve your career, everything about what you do. It's wonderful. Um, to connect with PASS, they are all over social media, free membership over at PASS.org. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Anthony Nosatino. Uh, we're going to do an architectural deep dive today on Kubernetes. So, Anthony, I'll let you roll with it. Cool. Thank you, sir. Can you see, show my screen? Yeah, now screen. we can. And it's in the correct view mode, looks like. Cool. 
All right. Well, thanks for joining. This is Inside Kubernetes, an architectural deep dive. Don't worry. We're going to start from zero and get you all the way into Kubernetes. So if you've never seen it before, that's fine. But we're going to go way into it so you guys understand how it works behind the scenes. So I'm Anthony Nocentino. I'm a consultant and trainer and founder of Centino Systems. I specialize in system architecture and performance. I've been in school for a very long time. I'm a data platform MVP and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. There's my contact info. It's going to show up again later. But if you do have any questions, feel free to hit me up via email uh, or on Twitter. I blog relatively frequently and I'm a Pluralsight author. And so this course uh, or this session that you see today is based off of a course that I just finished for Pluralsight earlier this month. If you want free access to that to reinforce the content, go ahead and hit me up via email and I'll give you a free card so you can watch this course on your own time to review that at your own leisure. And so here's where we're going to go today. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. So we're going to go pretty fast, uh, but you know it's a pretty deep topic on building these cloud native platforms. And we're going to start off with why. Like, why do we need something like Kubernetes? And we're going to look at container-based application deployment to help us understand that. Then we'll get into what is Kubernetes and the benefits that it provides, how it helps us solve some of the problems that, or challenges, I should say, that you get with container-based application deployment. With Kubernetes, you're going to learn that we model our systems in software, in code. And so we're actually going to learn about the Kubernetes API and how we can turn the things that we want to deploy into reusable code, leveraging API objects in Kubernetes. Once we kind of get the theory out of the way, we'll look inside of Kubernetes and look at the architecture, the actual server elements that support a Kubernetes cluster. And with all of that behind us, we'll dig into how to deploy applications and what it takes to build a production ready cluster. So lots and lots of stuff today. And we're gonna start off with container-based application deployment and understanding why people deploy things in containers now. So back in the day, we used to have single tier applications. Jokingly, I like to say anything written by IBM, right? And when we managed or built and deployed software this way, it was very hard, right? We had to build our code, we had to compile it, we had to ship it, burn it the DVD, however it is we got it out to the masses. And that process was challenging because you had to service and support this giant monolithic thing. And so over the years, we broke things up a little bit and we broke things into multi-tier applications or multi-tier architecture. So you hear buzzwords like service-oriented architecture, client and server model. And that increased the serviceability a little bit because I could operate on one part of the system as long as I respected the contract that I needed to expose the data to the other parts of my application. Taking that concept even further, you hear the buzzword now of microservices, right? Even drilling down even further into smaller, more easily changed or more easily serviceable units, right? Giving me the ability to manage smaller functions and use that as my element of deployment. And so with that, we needed a better way to get that stuff from the developer's computer, test it and out into production very, very quickly. And that's where the container claims comes in. And if you have, aren't familiar with containers, I'm going to do a quick 30 second 101 on what a container is and how it operates inside of your computer. So let's say we have a host operating system, could be a VM or a physical machine. I now have this thing that is a container that encompasses the application, the binaries and the libraries and whatever it takes to package up my app. And that's the unit of deployment. That's the thing I scoop up off of my developer's workstation. I test and push out the production. And this gives me the ability to manage and deploy multiple applications on a single operating system. Now, if I needed to bridge that beyond a single operating system, that's where things can get a little interesting. And so let's look how we would build a modern application architecture, a modern deployment in a container-based application. And so generally speaking, you're going to see three-tier web arch architecture still. So I have a web server, maybe it's backed up by a database server, and maybe I need to scale it out and add another web server. And maybe I get really good at what I do and I'm selling lots of widgets and I need to insert a caching tier, right? And this is kind of what you're going to see when you're deploying applications out in the wild today. So we have some questions to answer if we're using container-based applications. Where do I run this application? Meaning like what hardware do I actually start these containers on in my data center? How can I dynamically scale my application? If I wanted to grow from one web server to two or from two web servers to 10, how do I do that, right? Do I just want to run some code and make that happen? I don't know if that's a, the best way to manage that. 
And how do I consistently deploy? What if I need to do this again? What if it's a multi-tenant architecture where I need to have this model repeated over and over again? Or if I need to bridge this into another cloud, how can I scoop this platform up and deploy it somewhere else consistently? What if I need to deploy it in a down-level non-production environment for testing? And I want an exact copy of what I have in production. How do I do these things? And how do I consistently provide access to these services in my application, right? I want to have access into these container-based apps, which can come and go at the web tier, at the caching tier, and at the SQL tier or the data tier. Well, that's where something like Kubernetes fits in. And Kubernetes falls into a class of software called a container orchestrator. And there's lots of container orchestrators out there, but the container orchestrator Kubernetes is kind of taking over. I use the joke when I do this session in person, it's kind of like VHS and beta back in the day, right? Well, we all know what VHS is, and some of us might remember what beta is, but one of those became the primary media for distributing videos, right? Well, that's kind of the case with Kubernetes. It's really becoming the de facto standard for managing container-based applications in data centers. And so one of the biggest things that it provides to us, aside from container orchestration, the ability to start up and stop containers, which we'll look much more closely at throughout the remainder of the course, is infrastructure abstraction. As a developer, I can now deploy applications into Kubernetes, and I really don't have to care about the underlying infrastructure. Wait, I, I said that, and David's on the line. I really shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I didn't care about the underlying <laughs> infrastructure. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, it provides uh, an abstraction for me to have less interest in the underlying infrastructure that supports my applications. And the other big value that Kubernetes provides is desired state. If I design a multi-tier application with two web servers, a caching tier, and a SQL tier, I can tell Kubernetes to make sure that I always stay in that state. So if one of my web servers crashes, it's Kubernetes' job to make sure that another pod or another container pops up in the place of where that container was. And we'll look at all of the plumbing and how that works as we go through this. And so the big bucket elements, we're talking about Kubernetes and the benefits that it provides is this. I mean, you could probably sum it up in one line is managing state, right? I tell Kubernetes what to do. It starts those things up and it keeps them up and running for me without having me go and constantly monitor and make the changes to the platform for it to happen. It just does it for me. And we're gonna learn about the techniques and technologies behind that as we go through this today. Now, it also adds the value of speed and consistency of deployment. If you've started up a container, especially a SQL Server container, you know how fast it, it takes or how long it takes to just get from zero to container and getting SQL Server up and running. Take that philosophy and use that across all of your applications and the ability to spin up and scale out your applications very, very quickly. Not only is speed very valuable, but consistency as well. If we're writing these things in code, I can pick up the code that describes my environment and easily deploy it somewhere else in my infrastructure, again, another cloud provider or a down-level environment. Kubernetes also provides the ability for me to absorb change quickly. If I'm sitting out there with those two web servers, the caching tier and the SQL tier, and all of a sudden it's coming up on the holiday season and I need to get ready for the big rush for sales, I can very easily scale out my web tier simply by telling Kubernetes to go from scaling two web servers up to 200 web servers if I have the resources underneath to support that. It's literally as easy as changing an integer value in a configuration file, which we will do later today in a demonstration. It also provides the ability to recover quickly. If we lose a server, it's Kubernetes job to just spin up another pod or a container right back where it was. And we didn't get paged, we didn't get, well, who has pagers? Hmm. Again, I'm showing my age. We didn't get a text or an email that described what happened, Kubernetes just fixed it for us. It hides a lot of this complexity in the cluster for us. There's lots of networking abstractions and storage abstractions that we're gonna go through today that we just don't have to be so concerned about when we deploy our applications. We describe to Kubernetes what we want, and it's gonna do that for us. And it also provides a persistent access or application access, persistent application access endpoints. I need to adjust that bullet point there. What that means is I can point and stand up my application inside of Kubernetes, and as things might be changing out from underneath it as Kubernetes operates and redeploys pods and corrects itself if things skew from a desired state, but I always have a fixed access point to enter the applications or reach the data or caching tiers in my applications inside of Kubernetes. And so let's kind of revision that initial deployment that we had a second ago in this concept of what's called a Kubernetes cluster. 
So we have a cluster and we're gonna look at the internals of what this means as we go through this today, but we're gonna deploy our application in our cluster and we're gonna define those same things and it's gonna be Kubernetes job to stand these things up and make them present in the cluster. Well, how do we do that? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the Kubernetes API. Now we're gonna represent our system as a, uh, we're gonna represent our system, our resources in our system as code, right? Well, those things that are in the Kubernetes API describe the resources that we want to deploy. Now there's this thing called the API server, which is the main communication hub and kind of the orchestrator of what comes in and out of Kubernetes. Basically it's the thing that we tell, or the thing that we interact with to tell Kubernetes what to do, model in our system as objects. And so some of the objects that we're gonna look at today are gonna be pods, controllers, services, storage, and there are many more, but we're gonna focus primarily on these four, pods, controllers, services, and storage. And so these are the basic or core building blocks of the resources that we're gonna to build to model the system that we want to construct and deploy in Kubernetes. And so let's start off with pods. What's a pod? Well, a pod is gonna be one or more container. And we started off at the beginning talking about container-based application deployment. So this is gonna be your application or the service that you wanna deploy in your Kubernetes cluster. And so you might ask why one or more containers? Well. Generally speaking, you're gonna have one container in a pod unless the two pods or the two containers are tightly coupled in some sort of producer consumer relationship. But generally speaking, you're gonna have one pod and one container. And a common question that you get is, well, would I wanna put my database and my web server in the same pod? Not quite. Those are two completely separate services. So you wanna be able to scale and grow and make and build the infrastructure around each one of those tiers independently. So if I want to add more web servers, well, I'd scale those pods out. If I needed to add more database servers, I would scale those pods out. Of course, there's like database stuff that I have to deal with inside of there to do that. But that's the idea there from a, a pod design standpoint. So it's your basic application or your service. And it's also the most basic unit of work, right? So when we deploy an app and we stand up a pod, well, it's Kubernetes job to make sure that that thing is up and running in our cluster. And so it's the unit of scheduling. And so that's the job of Kubernetes is to figure out where to run this application in the cluster that we built. And so those pods and nodes, or excuse me, I shouldn't use that word yet, but that cluster that we have with the resources available inside of that. And so it's Kubernetes job to make sure that those are up and running. Now, if you've worked containers before, you've heard of this term that containers are ephemeral. And what that means is they don't really maintain state inside of the container. And well, this is a past HADR uh, virtual chapter. So the one thing that we're really concerned about here is maintaining state over time. And so what we have to do is be able to decouple the ephemerality of a container or the fact that a container will revert back to its image when it's restarted and decouple that from the data that we want to persist. And I'm going to show you guys how to, you can persist the data externally from the pod, but still bolt on a container to the front and get access into that data. And that's a concept that I'm really interested in, in Kubernetes and containers is the decoupling of the pod or the container or the computation itself from the underlying storage. I just put a pod or a container in front of where my databases live and I get access to those. So that's pod. So those are the fundamental unit of work. That's what we're gonna do is we're gonna stand up SQL Server pods and web server pods today in our demonstrations. But we're gonna learn now about how um, Kubernetes manages state in our applications with this concept called controllers. And so when we define a deployment inside of Kubernetes, we might need to wrap up a construct around our pods such that we use a controller to create and manage those pods for you. And it's the responsibility of a controller to define your desired state. And so in the example earlier where I had two web servers and I wanted to scale it to four web servers, well, that's gonna be the responsibility of a controller. I tell Kubernetes, I want two web servers of this particular type of container. And it's just gonna go do that for me and deploy two of those pods. Now, one of the things that controllers do is they respond to pod state and pod health events. Well, what does that mean? Well, a pod is gonna have state, right? My pod is gonna be up and running and ready if the processes in the containers inside of that pod are up and running and doing the things that they should be doing. Now that's state, 
pods also can have health. I can attach health checks or liveness probes to the applications inside of my pod to make sure that they're responding appropriately. For example, if it's a web application, I could say, I expect a 200 OK when I hit this URL on this pod. And so those two things together, pod state and pod health, define the health of my pod and application. If one of those things skews from a desired state, well, it's the responsibility of Kubernetes to respond. And if my pod is now unhealthy, well, depending on how, what I tell Kubernetes to do, it could kill that pod and redeploy it and automatically heal my application. Now, the construct that I'm describing is kind of the overall picture for most controllers, but there's a particular type of controller that I just described, and that's the replica set, where we're gonna replace pods in a particular fashion. There's many different types of controllers based on your needs. There's things like stateful sets and daemon sets, whatnot, based on different use case scenarios and how you need to deploy your applications. But fundamentally, if you're using uh, basic pod deployments, replica sets are gonna be where you start, kind of. We're gonna look at another thing called a deployment. What a deployment is, is it allows me to migrate between replica sets. So you're not really gonna ever deploy a replica set directly in Kubernetes. You're going to define a deployment, which under the hood is going to instantiate a replica set for you uh, automatically. Now, the value of deployments and replica sets is, or I can use a deployment and deploy a version one of my application, and it's going to instantiate a version one replica set. I can then modify my deployment and deploy a version two of my replica set and leverage the deployment construct to transition my workload between version one and version two or roll back if I need to. And so that gives me some flexibility on how I can manage the rollout or the deployment of my applications inside of Kubernetes. And so when you work and you look at source code that's available on the internet to download, you're going to see deployment in most of the examples that you see. But under the hood, those are really replica sets that provide that controller functionality. All right, so we've talked about pods, the primary workload, controllers, and how they keep us in a desired state. Let's talk about how we can get access into our applications. And talk about services. And what services do is they provide persistency to this ephemeral world where I have Kubernetes maybe killing and redeploying pods underneath the hood, and I still need to have a single entry point to access my application and make sure that I'm getting, getting distributed to the correct pods. And that's where a service comes in. It provides a networking abstraction for access to the applications that are provided by pods. So if a replica set is killing off a pod because it's unhealthy, well, it's the job of Kubernetes to make sure that my replica set or it's the job of the service to make sure that I get that registered access to that individual pod that was replaced. And so we get a fixed IP and DNS name for the service that we want to have access to with Kubernetes managing that infrastructure abstraction. So we have that fixed access, but underneath the hood, it's the job of Kubernetes to make sure that we get load balanced to the correct pods servicing our applications. And so I introduced, introduced this concept already that pods can be redeployed inside of Kubernetes, but in the service, what's going to happen is as, as those pods come and go, it's going to automatically update the service and automatically update how that workload gets distributed to the pods as they change out under the hood. Furthermore, if I scale my application by going from two to four to 10 web servers or pods to service my application, again, it's the job of the service to manage that for me. So let's move on into storage now. And this is kind of an interesting topic because we're clearly mostly data professionals at the HADRVC here. And we're gonna talk about storage and how Kubernetes can decouple from the pod where it stores your data. And we're gonna start off with a concept called a persistent volume. Before persistent volumes, we had uh, just regular volumes in Kubernetes. And what that means is when I described a pod in code, I would, when I describe the pod in code, what I would do is I would say, this is the pod, this is the container that it's gonna run or the container image, and here's the storage. It's gonna be on this iSCSI mount or this NFS directory. And what that did was that tightly coupled that individual pod with that individual storage. And so we had to come up with a better way to decouple those things from each other. And so that's where the persistent volume comes in. What a persistent volume is, is, is pod independent storage where the administrator defines the storage at the cluster level. And so we don't really have to be so concerned about where the configuration of that information is when we deploy our pods. In the example that I gave a second ago, we had to be very, very keen on where that stuff actually lived. And so with this concept of pod independent storage, we define at the cluster level 
the different types of storage that we want to have access to in our applications. And so how do we get our pods connected to that storage? If we define that in our underlying cluster, well, we have this thing called a persistent volume claim. And what happens is that the pod makes a claim on the persistent volume, thus decoupling the pod from the storage. And so what you'll see in code and a lot of examples, especially if you're looking at the SQL Server examples online, you'll see pers persistent volume claims of a type of storage. You'll see, you know, um, local storage, remote storage, things like that. And the claim is going to be serviced by the cluster and the cluster will map that back to the actual persistent volume that can, can meet the requirements of that claim based on things like read write policy and the number of pods and also what's called a storage class, which we'll look at when we get into the demonstrations. So it looks like this in our cluster, we'll define some storage. We'll basically in our pods say, hey, we want to claim some storage of this type. And it's the job of Kubernetes to put those two things together, together for us. Now, the, um, excuse me. So now that we have the theory behind us, now let's look inside of a Kubernetes cluster and look at exploring the Kubernetes architecture. So we're going to shift from the constructs of uh, describing our infrastructure and code to what goes on inside of a Kubernetes cluster. And inside of there, we're going to have this thing called a master. The master is going to run a couple of services. Fundament the most critical is going to be the API server because that's going to be the thing that everything in our cluster communicates with. We have a cluster store, which is where we're going to persist the state of our applications or our deployments in Kubernetes. And so the API server being completely stateless, just providing access into the things or the objects that are going to be stored in the cluster store. The cluster store is implemented with a, a key value store called etcd. And so that's going to be a database or a key value store, depending on your perspective, that persistently stores that information. There's a scheduler, which has the responsibility of figuring out where to run our pods in our cluster, and a controller manager, which has the responsibility of implementing those controllers that we talked about, the things that implement the desired state of our applications and make sure that we stay in that desired state. Now, administratively, we're going to use a program called kubectl or kubectl or kubectl, whatever you want to call it, but kubectl is what I call it. kubectl is going to be the tool that we're going to use to interact with the API server to make things happen, right? It's the administrative tool that we'll use to do things like deployments, uh, interrogate the system for information, pretty much anything. And that tool talks directly to the API server. Now this describes the master, right? This is kind of the, what's called the control plane or the thing that basically is in charge of all the operations inside of a Kubernetes cluster. There's also a thing called nodes and you can have many nodes based on the scalability of the applications that you need to deploy inside of your cluster. So that's going to be the thing that does the actual work. On a node, you're going to have a thing called a kubelet. And the kubelet's responsibility is to monitor the API server for changes in state and work that has been assigned to the node. The kube proxy has the responsibility of implementing network services. So generally speaking, this is going to be an IP tables, and it's going to expose whatever things that we're running inside of our container-based applications on an individual node onto the network and provide that networking abstraction for us. Good news is we don't have to deal with any of that plumbing. Kubernetes does what we does what we need for us. Now, there's also what's called a container runtime. The container runtime, conventionally or by, or by default inside of Kubernetes, is going to be Docker, but it could be any of the other container runtimes that meet a certain type of interface for Kubernetes. It's the container runtime's job to go pull the containers off the, from your container registry and start those up inside of your cluster. And so the kubelet always talks to the API server and asks the API server in a polling way, do you have work for me? And so as pods get scheduled, the uh, Cuba is going to ask the API server for that information. And if there is a pod scheduled, it's going to kick that pod up on that node. Furthermore, if there's any state change from a queue proxy standpoint, it's polling the API server as well. And it's the responsibility of the proxy to implement those services if those things have changed. And so let's look at these things a little more graphically now. We looked at controllers a little bit ago, and let's look at controller operations for pods. And so let's say we have this cluster with more than one node. Now we have two. And inside of that cluster, I use kubectl to deploy an application that consists of some number of pods, in this case, three, right? 
And so everything's up and running and happy, happy. We're passing all of our health checks and aliveness probes and our services are doing great. And all of a sudden something bad happens and a node disappears. What's gonna happen? Well, if we deployed this application with a replica set and we said, hey, we need three pods to support this workload, Kubernetes is gonna spit out another pod for us. It's gonna go through the process of recognizing that that state has changed. It's going to go then schedule a pod and it's going to deploy that pod on an available worker or a node in our cluster if the resources are available. Uh, if you notice, it went directly in this scenario, it went directly to the node and didn't schedule it on the master. In Kubernetes by default, the master won't run regular user workloads. Those components that you see inside of the master there, the API server, the cluster store, the scheduler, and the controller manager actually deployed as pods as well. And so those pods start up in a special way and they are always run on the master node. And so to protect the master node, the master node is gonna be what's called tainted from a scheduling standpoint and won't run any user workload. And so you'll see that in if you build this out in testing scenarios, but oftentimes some people untaint the master in lab environments, they need those additional resources as well to support workload. But in production environments, you definitely wanna leave that the way it is. So let's take a second to look at services now from a cluster perspective. And so we're gonna zoom out a little bit and let's say again, we deploy our application. This time we're gonna have four application pods supporting our service. Now we wrap that up in a service and in this case, it's gonna be HTTP. And we're gonna look at code on how to do this all in a little bit. And all the pods, what they're gonna do is it's gonna connect and register the endpoints into that service there if they support that application. Our users are gonna come and enter that application on a front end persistent IP. And it's the responsibility of the service to load balance or distribute that workload to all of the, the pods underneath that support this application. Now let's say something bad happens and one of our pods goes south and either fails a health check or the application itself crashed and the pod shut down. Well, it's Kubernetes job to recognize that and deregister that pod from load balancing, deploy a new pod, and re-register that pod in a load balancing scheme and distribute that workload evenly inside the cluster. And that happened, again, without any pagers going off, it just fixed itself, maintaining the desired state. So now that we know kind of how Kubernetes does all of the things that it does, well, how do we tell Kubernetes what we want it to do? Well, that's where these concepts come in. And we're gonna look at deploying applications inside of Kubernetes. So if you've ever sat down and executed a series of commands to configure your system, you've done what's called imperative configuration. I've executed command X and Y and Z to get me to a state that is the desired state for my application. Now, as SQL pros, you're familiar with the concept of declarative code because you write code like select whatever from a table and it's SQL Server's job to go get that for you. It turns it into a query plan, retrieves the data, and gives that back to you. You don't tell a SQL Server exactly what to do to retrieve that data. Is there a question, David? Oh, whoops. Um, not yet. We'll wait okay. until the end. <laughs> oh, thank you. So those are the two types of ways that we can deploy applications, both imperatively, where we define things command after command, and declaratively where we describe what we want. And we can do both of those inside of Kubernetes, but what we really wanna to get to is describing our configuration in code or declaratively. And we do that in code in Kubernetes using two types of ways to represent what we want to have happen in uh, YAML or in JSON. And I prefer YAML, but under the hood, Kubernetes is gonna talk to JSON, but we don't have to worry about that. Again, it's gonna manage that transition from YAML to JSON for us. And so let's look inside of what's called a manifest or a, a deployment manifest to describe what we want Kubernetes to do. And so it's gonna be a simple text file describing in code what we want Kubernetes to do for us, but we do have to deal with some, a little bit of plumbing right off the bat in this concept called an API version. In this case, you see API version V1. I'm gonna add one more line here. You see kind equals pod. So in this example here, we're gonna deploy a pod together. Now, what API version does is it describes, or really it fixes the definition of a pod at a particular point, right? So I know that a V1 pod will always look this way. It will always have these required elements or these optional fields. Later on, Kubernetes can move a pod forward and maybe it'll have a version 1.1 pod that has some additional functionality. But I know that when I use the API version V1, I will get a V1 pod. So it adds some stability to the code 
that I'm writing to describe what I want Kubernetes to do for me. This is completely independent of the version of the software, which is currently at version 1.13. So those two things are completely decoupled, the version of Kubernetes, the software, and the API version itself. Now, in this case, we're going to describe a pod, and it's going to require that it has some metadata, like a name. And so here we're going to describe an Nginx pod, which an Nginx is a simple web server that can run inside of a container. Now that we have the core elements done describing the pod, we need to add the technical elements that describe the pod and what in what's called a spec. So from here on out, we're going to see things like containers. And inside of there, we can have one or more containers. In this case, I'm going to have one container, and its name is going to be Nginx. This could be whatever I want to call it, potato or you know, web server 2, whatever it is. But it's going to be backed up by an image. In this case, you see Nginx as well. Since my default container runtime is Docker, it's going to go and pull the latest Nginx image from Docker Hub to service this pod. If I needed to be more specific and pull from a private registry or maybe from Microsoft's registry where it deploys its containers from, I would put the full container registry path there. Now, not required, but kind of required if we're building network-based applications like web servers, we're going to have things like ports associated with our container as well. This container port here you're going to see is the port inside of the container that the application runs on. So this is going to be like the basic elements that we would need to stand up a simple web server as a pod inside of Kubernetes. Now, that's the code, right? We save this in a text file that describes our system and we use kubectl and we say kubectl apply minus f and we feed in that file that we saved that yaml in, in this case nginx.yaml and it's the job of kubectl to send that convert it to json and send it into the api server for the api server to go ahead and start that pod up for us and so let's look at what happens behind the scenes when we do that so here we go with our cluster again and I sit down at my workstation and I use kubectl to submit a YAML file into Kubernetes. In this case, let's maybe be a little bit more advanced than a bare pod. Let's say we're gonna describe a replica set of pods or a deployment of several pods. So I say kubectl apply and I send in the YAML file that describes that into the API server. Now, a couple of things happen right off the bat. The first thing that happens is it authenticates who I am. Then it authorizes, can I actually create a pod or not? based on the role-based security. It then checks the syntax of the file, and if everything's happy, happy, it's going to take that JSON and store it in the cluster store inside of the master. Now, the scheduler and the controller manager are in communication with the cluster store, and they receive notifications that something has changed inside of the cluster store. It pops out that we need to start up a replica set. The replica set's like, cool, I have work to do now. I need to stand up some number of pods, let's say three or four, and it stores back into the cluster store the number of pods that it needs to start up. We still haven't started any pods yet. We just stored the fact that the controller manager wanted to start up these additional pods. We'll say four. Now, the scheduler receives a message that there's unscheduled pods inside of the cluster store. The scheduler figures out based on the resources required in the pods and the resources available in the cluster where to start up those pods on the nodes in the cluster. And it writes that information back into the cluster store. Still hasn't started the pods yet because the kubelet is going to be monitoring. Oops, I went one click too far there. I, all right. The kubelet is monitoring the API server, asking the API server, do I have any work? Now it answers the question, yes, you have work. Start up these pods. And that's what happens. When the kubelet goes and starts up those pods, it kicks a message to the container runtime, downloads the container pod or the container image, and starts up the pod. If there was a service involved, it'll implement that service on the cube proxy. All right, so let's dig in a little further and do this together. So I have a cluster running on my laptop here in a collection of VMs, just one master and one node, and we're going to deploy a web application together. I'm going to show you how to access the services in that cluster for that particular web application, and then we're going to do some really fun stuff with deploying SQL Server in a replica set with persistent storage in our Kubernetes cluster. And so let's go ahead and do that together. Any interesting questions rolling in yet, sir? Uh, there are a number of questions in here. I think what we'll do, we'll save them to the end because you're on a good cool. roll. All right, thank you. So here we are, I'm in VS Code and we're gonna do two different things here. We're gonna start off with an imperative configuration. I'm gonna show you guys how to execute the sequence of commands to get stuff up and running. And then we're gonna shift gears. I'm gonna show you how to describe things in YAML 
and deploy that inside of Kubernetes to get that up and running as well. And so we're going to start off with deploying a basic pod. And we're going to use that tool, kubectl, and we're going to tell it to run. And we're going to tell it to run a pod named Hello World. In this case, again, it's all imperative. So I'm saying exactly what I wanted to do at this point in time. We're not using YAML yet to describe our solution. I'm going to tell Kubernetes to run a specific image coming from the Google Container Registry, and it's a simple Hello World application. And when I tell Kubernetes to run this pod, when I run this code, at the bottom here, you can see what it actually did. It's like, hey, what you were trying to do in deploying a pod is deprecate it. And I'm, what I'm going to do is actually change it out and deploy a deployment for you. So it's wrapping up that bare pod inside of a deployment. If I wanted to run a bare pod itself, I needed some additional attributes. But it's a good, quick way to get a deployment up and running. Now, let's go ahead and look at what it actually did for us. And so I'm going to ask Kubernetes, hey, Kubernetes, get a deployment. In this case, my deployment name is Hello World. And so I want to get the information about that deployment. At the bottom there, you can see I have the Hello World deployment up and running. There's one pod servicing it because that's all it did by default when I executed that command. It's up to date in that it's running the correct version of the deployment. Remember, we can use Kubernetes to move between different versions of replica sets, and it's up and available. Now, we go a little bit further, and I can ask for the replica sets information if I want to look behind the scenes at the replica sets supporting that individual pod or that individual deployment. So here we see the deployment name, and it adds a unique identifier on there because those can be dynamically generated based on what I tell Kubernetes to do. So we see hello world, but this whole thing represents the replica set currently in the desired state across the board. Very cool. So underneath that, underneath the replica set, we see pods. And so let's say kubectl get pods, we can see hello world, our replica sets ID, and the individual pod. And so that all together is the pod name, but that's the individual elements that make up the pod's name. We can see that it's up and running and ready. There's one container in this pod, it's up and running and it hasn't been restarted and it's been alive for about 81 seconds. And so that idea there, I want to kind of drill that home is a deployment is made of replica sets and a replica set is made up of a collection of pods. Now let's go a little bit further. I have lots of code comments in here for you guys. So if you want to go ahead and redo this or reconstruct this on your own, kind of describe what's going on. But let's go ahead now and expose that deployments application as a persistent service for us to access in our cluster. So kubectl expose, what am I going to expose? A deployment, and that deployment's name is hello world. Now I'm going to expose that deployment on port 80, which is a, tra a traditional web server port. That container-based application actually listens on 8080. So those don't necessarily have to match up one-to-one -one or exact numbers. I can take this and point it to whatever the container port is running behind the scenes. So let's go ahead and run that code together to get our deployment up and running. Now, I need to get some information about that deployment because I don't know the IP address that that deployment was persisted at. So I asked the cluster, I'm like, hey, cluster, kubectl get service, hello world, and it's going to tell me what IP address it allocated and will persist for the duration of this deployment. It allocated to that service. And so let's go ahead and grab that IP and throw that in my clipboard. And then I'm going to use this web browser or the command line web browser curl to access that application. So here you can see curl. It's an HTTP based service at this IP running on that port. If I run that, you can see the contents of my application is simply at the bottom here. You see hello world. That's the version of the application and it spits out the actual pod name. So here you see hello world and all the other fun stuff associated with the pod name. So now what if I wanted to scale my application up? Now this is crazy, right? If you've built and templated web servers for a living at any point in your career, this is going to make you cry about how much time you spent doing all of that in your data centers. So I'm going to use this command kubectl and I'm going to edit my deployment. I'm going to edit the hello world deployment. And so what happens when I execute this command, it goes and kubectl talks to the API server and says, hey, API server, give me the JSON representation of that deployment. It then quickly converts it to YAML and I have the YAML representation of what's being executed at this point in time inside of my cluster. And I can go down here and see things like API server, meta, and that describe the deployment that we're working with, that we stood up with that simple command when we started our system. Now, if I go here in the spec, I can change the number of replicas, let's say from one to three. Again, this is gonna make you cry because the second I do this and save that file out, I have two additional web servers deployed in my application. You want to see the proof? Here you go. kubectl get pods. You can see I have three pods up and running now 
servicing my application. The endpoints were updated in the service and the load is being distributed across all three. Want some proof of that? Let's do it together. I'm gonna use curl again. I'm gonna point it to the load balanced IP. I'm gonna run curl a couple of times. At the bottom there, you can see it's distributing the load across the multiple pods in the cluster. And I did that simply by changing an integer value in a configuration. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And I'm crying thinking about all of that time I spent doing that in early parts of my career. Now, here's what I did real quick. I'm gonna clean up before we move into the next demonstration. So if you wanna get rid of something, QCTL delete, what are you gonna delete? You're gonna delete the thing. In this case, it's gonna be a service. Hello world, I'm gonna get rid of the deployment. And I real quickly did a kubectl get all to describe all of the resources that were up and running at that point in time. And you can see those pods changed state from ready to terminating. They received a signal to shut down and they gracefully shut down the pods or the containers supporting those pods. And then subsequently the pods shut down behind the scenes. So if I do kubectl get all again, I should just get one line and I do, and it's the actual Kubernetes service running and supporting the cluster. So that's imperative configuration of web servers. Let's look at declarative configuration of SQL. Now, this one's gonna be kind of interesting. This is one of my favorite demonstrations. What we're gonna see here is I'm going to stand up some persistent storage. I'm gonna deploy a SQL server in a replica set. I'm gonna kill SQL server running as a pod and Kubernetes is automatically gonna put a SQL server right back where it was and give me access into my databases, which is crazy if you think about it, because now I have a highly available application with no special technologies inside of SQL Server. Now, if that meets your recovery objectives, that's a pretty cool concept, I think. Now, to get started off, I'm going to add some persistent storage on an individual cluster node in my cluster. And so I'm gonna make a directory on C1 node one which is where this pod is going to be scheduled to. I'm gonna make a directory called slash data, MSSQL dash data. And I'm gonna do that because I will, I don't have a high-end SAN backing up this demonstration to have shared storage. We'll talk about that when we look at building production ready clusters in a little bit. So I have some additional code in here for the tools that I have installed. I have uh, SQL CMD and some other stuff installed to help make this demonstration easier. easier. Uh, and so that's what that code does there. I'm gonna throw a password into uh, an environment variable, just a real strong password or something so strong. And I'm gonna use that to store that password now into Kubernetes. And I'm gonna use this command, Kubernetes create secret, generic, and the secret name is gonna be MSSQL and the key is gonna be SA password. I'm gonna feed in that environment variable there. What this is gonna do is any pod that I stand up can go and read this data if I give it access to it and tell it to read this information out. And it's gonna, anytime I stand up a SQL Server pod, it's going to use this password as the SA password to start up that SQL Server pod or the container under the hood. So I have some code here describing in YAML, the persistent volume, the persistent volume claim, then the SQL Server and then a SQL Server service. And so let's go through all of that together. And so when you're online looking at things like um, docs.microsoft.com that show you how to do these things, you're gonna see a lot of this code and getting through it the first time is kind of hard because you have to figure out what all of these resources are and how they piece together. And so this is kind of the process to get you to that point where you can very easily use those examples. And so in this code here, pv.yaml, I'm gonna describe a persistent volume. I wanna define first what's called a storage class. What a storage class is, it gives me the ability to address my storage by an easy name. And so I'm gonna say storage class, local storage, so that I know that this storage is gonna come from that particular storage that I'm gonna bolt on in that directory that I just created. I'll go down a little bit further. We see the API version for this type of object. What is it gonna be? It's a persistent volume. And I'm giving it a name, PV, persistent volume, SQL data. Now the technical specifications for this, I'm gonna describe that it's gonna have 10 gigs of storage. It's going to be part of my underlying file system and access modes, read, write once. This means that one pod is allowed to come along and attach to this persistent volume, which kind of makes sense if we're dealing with relational databases. I really only wanna have one person having access to this underlying storage. Now there's this thing called a persistent volume reclaim policy, retain. So when I delete this stuff, it's gonna leave it alone and not change anything. There's other policy types where it could zero things out or delete it or whatever, but th that would be bad news if we were wanting to persist our databases in this 
persistent volume. So we tell it to retain. We assign a storage class and then we give it a local path. And so we bind that storage to this path that we just created together up top. Now this persistent volume is gonna live in one place in our cluster. It's gonna live on C1 node one. And so this code right here is a way to describe the node affinity that this storage lives on that cluster. And so anytime this pod wants to attach to that storage, it has to go through this node. If we had a more sophisticated environment, this could actually be removed as long as all of the nodes had access to that shared underlying storage. Think of like storage area networks or NASs or things like that. And we could have that be exposed as a persistent volume. Now we're gonna define a persistent volume claim, which is a lot simpler. We say persistent volume claim, give that a name, PVC SQL data, give it a storage class so that we bind it to that named uh, storage type. We give it an access mode. Now the pers persistent volume claim is going to have to look for persistent volumes that match in size and in access mode and other attributes. And so that's what we're describing there. Now we use the same commands that we use to deploy pods to deploy all of this code as well. So we say kubectl apply minus f pv.yaml and pvc.yaml. So I'll go ahead and feed these both in. Of course, if I wanted to roll those up into one file, I could, but I just, for demonstration purposes, I have them broken out. We can ask Kubernetes for the information about these resources. So kubectl get, you see pv and pvc here, and we ask for those by name, and we can get the information about these particular resources. So, so now if you're doing this in a lab for the first time, you're probably going to get frustrated as I was and wanted to throw my laptop out the window and that these things didn't quite match up. But it all has to kind of line up when we're talking about things like access modes, storage classes, and where that stuff lives physically in your cluster. And so that's kind of why I had that plumbing to describe where the storage physically lived in my system. So that's all great, right? Now, if I'm a storage administrator or a cluster administrator, this all makes sense to me. But if I am a developer wanting to deploy an application, I don't care about any of this stuff, right? I want to just consume storage. And that's where storage classes come in. And we can define multiple storage classes that we want to consume at higher level. So if there's a storage class like tier one SSD, well, I would consume tier one SSD in my application. It would make the persistent volume claim and then service that persistent volume claim with a persistent volume. Being careful not to say that we don't care about infrastructure, David. <laughs> so let's move forward and now deploy SQL Server. So inside of here, inside of this SQL Server.yaml, I have the description to define SQL Server as a deployment, right, backed by replica sets. And so let's go through this code together. API version is going to be a V1 beta 1 API. So it's a little bit different than we saw in the presentation portion of today's talk. It's going to be a deployment. We're going to give it a name, MSSQL-deployment. Now we get down to the spec, and we have some interesting information. We're telling Kubernetes to always keep one SQL server here, right? And so if something goes wrong, it's the responsibility of Kubernetes to put a SQL server pod back in that same location. Now, it could be on a different place in our cluster, but in our case, since we're bound to that particular type of storage, it's always going to hit C1 node 1. But if we were had a storage, a shared storage subsystem and that resource is available across the cluster, it could go anywhere in our cluster. So now we define the pod template. That's what's next. This is the pod that's going to get started up in our Kubernetes, or the, yeah, the pod that's going to get started up to support our replica set. So we have labels which help us identify and helps Kubernetes identify members of the replica set. And we'll talk a little bit more about those maybe another day. And we'll go down to the spec here we can see that we have a container in the spec, just like we did with a pod spec, but this is a pod template that describes the rep what the replica set needs to do. We give that container a name, it's backed by an image. In this case, you see a much longer one, where in the other example, it was just Nginx. When we looked at it in the presentation, here you can see the full path to the container registry from Microsoft describing that pod, or describing that container image. It's gonna run on a port, the container port is gonna be 1433. Now to start up SQL Server as a container, we need two things. We need to accept the EULA, of course, insert licensing jokes here, and we also need an SA password. And where are we gonna get that SA password from? Well, we could describe it as a command line parameter uh, when we started it up imperatively, or we can pass it in literal, literally into the code, but that would be bad news. So we can store it in our secret key ref here, pull out the name of that particular thing, pull out that particular value, and it's gonna reread that from the SA password that we created earlier on in the demonstration. 
So now that we have all of the things together that we need to start up this pod, except for storage. Inside the pod, we're still inside the pod part of this back here. We're going to tell the pod that we want to mount a volume name, MSSQLDB, at this location. And if you're familiar with SQL Server on Linux, that's the default location at which SQL Server will put all of its information that it needs to persist. Things like data files, log files, error log files, and all of that fun stuff. Now, that volume is defined right here. Here we see volumes, MSSQLDB, right? That's the name that matches right there. That volume is going to be a backed by what's called a persistent volume claim or that claim that we built together just a little bit ago. So now when I deploy this with kubectl apply minus f sql, it's gonna go pull the image. Well, it's gonna do all the stuff that we talked about, feed it into the API server. It's gonna uh, store it in the cluster store. It's gonna create the controller for the replica set. It's gonna schedule the pod. It's gonna kick a notification or the kubelet's gonna pull for a notification. It's gonna pull the container runtime. It's gonna pull down the pod, start it up and get that all going. And if we do kubectl get pods, we'll see that we have a SQL Server deployment up and running. Now, this is probably my favorite command inside of Kubernetes is kubectl describe, because it gets you all the blood and guts details of what's going on inside of your replica set. And so here we can see the name, MSSQL deployment, the replica set name and the pod name. We can see that it was scheduled to C1 node one and when it was scheduled just a few seconds ago. It's controlled by this replica set. And we can see the containers that support the application. We see the port inside the container, but it's not exposed yet on a host port inside of our cluster. So actually we have no way to access the application yet inside of here. Now I'm gonna jump down and skip some of this output to show you the bottom here, which is a very valuable piece of information, events. And so if you're trying to troubleshoot why your pods aren't starting up in a replica set, go here. Here we can see what's going on and what Kubernetes does. And the first thing that it did is it scheduled the pod. It's assigned it to C1 node one. It pulled the container on the kubelet on C1 node one and it pulled the container image mcr.microsoft.com, et cetera. But in this case, it was already present on the machine because well, pulling containers during demonstrations can be a little bit challenging. So I made sure that that was there first. It then created the container and started it up on C1 node one. And so that process, if something goes wrong, you're gonna see it right there. Now I'm gonna go ahead and expose that as a service. And to do that, we have the YAML to describe the service. Service here, we're gonna be for this uh, SQL Server deployment. Now the selector here has to do with the label that was applied to the replica set. The selector is how Kubernetes knows to route this information to a particular pod. The ports for this service, we're gonna listen on 1433 and we're gonna send it to 1433. And so let's go ahead and run that code to get that up and running. Now with that, we have a service that is showing up as MS scale deployment. So let's grab that IP, store that into an environment variable there. I'm gonna use save that so I can reuse that a couple of times. And I'm gonna ask SQL Server with SQL CMD. I'm gonna say, hey, SQL CMD, what's your serve at at server name? And it's gonna give me the pod name that clips off the end there just because of the width of the row. Now let's go ahead and create a database inside of there. And now we created test database one with SQL CMD. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna look at where that information is actually stored in the cluster. Cause remember this is gonna be abstracted out and stored externally from the pod itself. And that's gonna live on C1 node one in the directory that we created together. So if I look inside of there, we see the data path, the log path, and some additional information that's used by SQL server on Linux. If I look inside that individual directory, again, this is on C1 node one, you can see master, model, TempDB, and the database that I just created a few seconds ago on that system. There we go. Ah, that happens when you type during demos. Now let's go and look at what SQL Server thinks. SQL Server thinks these things live in var opt MSSQL. Now remember when we defined in the pod, or excuse me, the, the deployment, that the volume was gonna be attached at var log, uh, Varlog MSSQL and the physical storage actually lives at this location. And it's up to Kubernetes to manage that abstraction for us. So now, if we do something like this and crash SQL Server, what's gonna happen? Well, Kubernetes is going to restart the application automatically for us. And you can see restarts there. You see restarts incrementing, that's usually a bad thing. 
we can go a little bit further and delete the pods. I'm gonna grab this code here and put it at the bottom and I'm gonna delete the pod that's servicing our application. So conceptually what's happening is I'm tearing a pod off the front end. It's gonna, it's gonna gracefully shut down the SQL server. That's what's taking so long right here. Once it's shut, shut down, it's gonna delete that pod and it's up to the replica set to do something like deploy a new pod. And so there we see we went from DK VLJ to BPBTM. Brand new pod pulled from mcr.microsoft.com to service that container to get that pod up and running. So that kind of decoupling of the state of what's happening inside of the container or the pod and what's happening inside of our persistent volume. So now let's grab this IP, put that right. Oh, actually the IP didn't change, my bad. And go ahead and ask SQL Server what database this doesn't know about. It knows about master tempdb model, MSS, MSDB, and tempdb1, which we created just a second ago, living in that fixed location. Again, we tore the pod off, threw it out. Kubernetes deployed a new pod. It mounted that volume from our persistent volume, exposed that in a SQL Server at var opt MSSQL, or var, yeah, var opt MSSQL, found a master database there had the metadata to mount all the other databases that live in a persistent volume and just gets up and running. And that is an amazing piece of functionality right there. So I also have the code here for you guys to clean up everything when you're done to delete up all the resources to get you back to a clean state when you're all done. So with that, let's jump back into the presentation and get a little bit closer to wrapping things up. Before we do that, let's talk about building production ready clusters. So these are kind of the big high level elements that you probably should focus on before you go into production again, because I showed you all this cool functionality, how you can get HA with like simple containers, all that fun stuff. And I want to just show you the big bucket elements that you should look at before you take this into production. Number one, scalability, right? Do you have enough resources to support the workload that you want to deploy? Next up is intercluster communication. Do we have, you know, full mesh networking? Do we have high availability? All of that stuff between the nodes such that our applications and nodes can all communicate with each other in a highly available fashion and getting around any badness that could happen inside of our data centers. Now, from a Kubernetes standpoint, the resources that you need to have highly available are gonna be the API server and etcd, which kind of makes sense, right? API server being the communication hub of our cluster where everything's gonna come in and out of. Now that's a stateless application. So that's really easy to scale out and add additional masters to support the API server. A little bit more challenging, but still easy is adding multiple replicas to etcd or the backend database that supports the cluster store that's built into etcd having having a um having replication between those individual uh databases now from a dr standpoint of course we want to back up etcd because that's the thing that needs we have have availability over time and there's other concepts with regards to bridging clusters between clouds and things like that for dr which you could also do as well then of course that data that lives in persistent volumes, hopefully I nailed that point home, lives somewhere for real, even though it's abstracted away into the cluster. And so we need to make sure that those persistent volumes are protected from both highly available, like HA standpoint, parallel paths and multiple paths, and things like that to support our workloads. Now I'm gonna shift gears for a second and you've probably seen this picture come out from Microsoft. This is a Microsoft big data cluster and it's, the new big thing in SQL Server 2019. And what I find interesting about this isn't what it does, but how Microsoft is deploying applications. If you look at the architecture, Microsoft has decided to leverage Kubernetes to deploy or to package and ship its next generation data platform. And so clearly, you know, if you're here, you're interested in learning this, you kind of get the ideas behind it or the, the, the value behind it. But if someone like Microsoft is making a play on something this big to be deployed inside of Kubernetes and deployed inside of customer sites, you think it's probably gonna catch on. And so let's keep a close eye on what Microsoft does with big data clusters. But again, this is changing the way that applications are being deployed and shipped. And so we covered a lot today, a little bit in the red zone, apologies for that. But we covered things like container-based deployments. We looked at what Kubernetes is, the benefits of using Kubernetes, uh, API objects to help model our systems, things like replica sets and deployments and persistent volumes and things like that. We looked at the architecture and kind of saw the flow of how an application is started up inside of Kubernetes and deployed some apps together. We did a replica set of web servers and then we did a replica set 
of SQL Server, both wrapped up inside of deployments. I killed SQL Server, killed that pod off, threw it away, and Kubernetes put a brand new pod right back there for me and attached to my databases. That's pretty darn cool. And we looked at kind of what's needed before you go into production. So don't want to leave you hanging. I have some resources here for you. Um, if you're using Docker for Windows or Docker for Mac, you have Kubernetes already. Inside of your Docker for Windows configuration, you'll find a checkbox to enable Kubernetes. Docker for Mac is going to be a little interesting for SQL Server pros because of an issue with persistent volumes. Uh, if you want more detail about that, hit me up. But it basically doesn't work. And so all of the things that I showed you today, even though I'm running on a Mac, uh, under the hood are running on Linux VMs. Minikube exists. I don't like it. Lots of other people do. Uh, so your mileage may vary, but that's also a good way to get started. Of course, the big managed service providers, Azure, uh, EKS from AWS, and GKE from Google, all have really good managed Kubernetes serve offerings. And so these are links to getting started, guys, to get up and going and working with Kubernetes as fast as you can. I have a plural site course that came out uh, about a month ago. Basically, if you've never seen Kubernetes before and you've never installed it before, start there to get going on that. Again, if you want a free, you want free access to that, hit me up and shoot me an email with my contact information there. So now, David, I think it's time for some questions. Yeah, we got some good questions here. Uh -oh. How do you accurately count and track licensed products like SQL Server that can be configured in hundreds of pods, some of which are running and others sitting idle while waiting to be deployed? You know, I don't know. Um, I don't know if the licensing model has been worked out for that yet, but I know in containers, just in raw containers, um, the same, I guess, like the, it's a similar model to virtualization, right? Where you can license it in that way. So, but honestly, that's not a thing that I'm really well versed in. So I'd check with your licensing professionals on that one. I can second that. The model is still a little fishy right now, depending on your use case and scenario. Um, right. Normally, if, uh, if you've got any specific questions with this, and I can give you some unofficial recommendations on it, but we'll have you check with your license provider there to confirm. Can you go back a slide to the resources slide? Sure. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, and I'll put these all on my website, and I'll give them to you, David, as well, so that everyone can have access to these. Perfect. And I should have this recording up by end of day today. Okay, a cool. couple more questions. Um, when and where do they use uh, etcd? So the etcd is the cluster store, right? So that's going to be the thing that persistently stores your configuration basically over time. It's a, basically a database. And so as we send commands into Kubernetes, it's the job of the API server to persist, it, persist that information into etcd. So hopefully that answers that, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. can you briefly re-describe the relationship between a replica set versus nodes, pods, containers, and controllers? Sure. So the from a high-level standpoint, if we go back and let's look at the demo code, that would be probably the best way to view that. So the deployment is kind of the overarching thing, right? I define a deployment. The deployment is going to instantiate a replica set that supports the thing that I just defined. Now, that replica set is going to spin off a pod from a pod template, let's say like that version one pod, and that's going to be up and running. And so when I do this, here, let's do this real fast. We can see that I have one pod up and running, and it's going to be backed by one replica set. Now, I can make a modification to this deployment and have another replica set that's based off of a container image or a pod template of a version two pod, and I can leverage the deployment to transition between version one and version two of the replica sets to make it basically affect that change of migrating between the one replica sets of pods to the other replica set of pods. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, the last question is how can we set up a Kubernetes environment? And you've got that on the resources page here. So this is fantastic. Yeah, so the big bucket elements here, the first one is if you're running Docker for Windows, check the checkbox and go. Minikube, a little higher maintenance. If you want, you know, if you have access to any of these cloud providers, they all offer managed services. So you finish whatever setup that is described in each one of these links here, and you'll have Kubernetes up and running or watch this course, and we'll start from blank VMs and install Kubernetes from scratch. From scratch. Perfect. This is great. Um, no more questions in the window here. So cool. I think uh, we're good to go. Again, thank you for taking your time to to speak today. Um, thanks to everybody for showing up who uh, was able to you know, 
skip some meetings or <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, you know, find a quiet spot and watch this. And if you're watching this on recording, thank you for your interest and we'll see you all next month. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much.